Welcome. Welcome to Randolph Memorial Baptist Church. A lot of energy and buzz in the air, which again means we are excited to see one another, excited to be together, um, and it's just good. Welcome to worship. Uh, and we've had, since last Sunday, we've cycled through all four seasons of the year, weather-wise. So today's going to be a pretty day, but uh, it's been an interesting week. I expect that to continue. All right, so we got a couple of announcements. People other than me have announcements and whatnot. I want to just say a couple of quick things. One, um, there is Children's Church, and so if they want to be on the front pew, they can. It didn't make it in the bulletin, but it is going to happen today. Uh, Stephanie, oh, it is in here. I've got it in my bulletin. But anyway, Children's Church will go upstairs uh, and stay upstairs um, during church. So if they want to go when it's time to leave, if you don't want to come to the front pew right now, you can go when they leave. They usually leave during the first hymn of the service. So you're welcome to do that. We do have a church-wide business meeting. And we'll move fairly rapidly in the meeting because you'll see in a minute you'll hear the announcement about what the teenagers are doing. But, but, we, do wanna, but we do have several things to cover. Um, what we'll do is as soon as I shake hands with folks who are leaving, I'll come back and we'll start. Now, I've been some confusion about where it's going to be. We had talked about moving the business meeting to the chapel. Then we were going to do it in the sanctuary because we had something we were going to display. That didn't work, but we've already moved it to the sanctuary. So we're going to be in the sanctuary, I, but I'm, I'm hoping that starting next year, we'll start doing the business meetings in the chapel so we can hear better. And it also gets warmer in there and all that good stuff. So the February meeting, I think we can get, make, make the transition to the chapel. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll have the microphones on during the business meeting. I'll make sure you hear. And if there's something we need to repeat, we'll make sure that everybody can articulate what they need to. But we'll be in here right after worship. So don't disappear if you're part of the church uh, and want to be a, be a part of that. And again, we will try to take, you know, uh, we won't try to take too long with everything. Uh, you see the ongoing activities. Um, there is, uh, I'm going to let our youth, uh, our new youth uh, director candidate is Katie Gross. She's going to come up and share some youth updates. Um, we will vote to make her official in two weeks. Following the Constitution, we've got to give it some time. So right after worship in two weeks, we will just one item, and that will be the item. And, and JR, during the business meeting today, I'll describe some things about that, uh, how we do that. But JR will lead that uh, vote in two weeks or someone from the, that committee. But Katie, if you want to come and tell us what's going on with the youth. Good morning, everybody. So I'm Katie. It's nice to meet all of you. Um, so 23 is, 2023 is coming to an end, and the youth is starting a new series called Finding My Place in This World. So today's lesson explored who am I? Um, and we read Jeremiah verses, or chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, um, and came to the understanding that everybody does have struggles and questions their self-worth at one time or another. Um, but God made us each unique and for an individual reason. And that the most important thing is that we are here and we are together and God will always protect us. So that's what our, our youth are learning about today. Uh, next week we'll discover who God is and our connection to God. Um, but today our service project is going to be, uh, uh, sorry, we're going to help take wood up to a, a, a woman who needs the wood for heat over the winter. So after worship um, in the fellowship hall, we'll have hot dogs and chips and drinks. So everybody is welcome to come and join us. Um, we'll go up the mountain and uh, have, a, have a fun time up there with the campfire. So we hope you'll join us. Um, next Sunday, November 12th, um, Pam and I will be leading an activity to help give the youth tools to uh, understand hard times as they come on. So that'll be 6.30 to 7.30 next Sunday night. So uh, I look forward to working with all of you and thank you. Good morning. Shoe boxes are due next week, and if anybody wants a box, there are two left, but they're due next week. When you bring them in, please set them on the front row because the ones that will be in here, we've already been through them and canvassed them, and we need to go through those. It's not that we think that you've put anything in there. We just have to go through them and check them. No liquids or anything like that. Um, this Wednesday, 
at one o'clock, women on mission are meeting and you don't have to bring anything before we said bring items, but you don't have to bring anything. And we will be packing bags, Christmas bags for people who just can't get out and get here. So we'd like everyone to join us at one o'clock. Also, we're collecting coats for kids, which is up to a girl size 16, and they'll be going the last week of the month over to Chestnut Hill Baptist. Uh, if you know anybody that needs a coat, they can call over there and set out an appointment. They will be giving them out on December the 2nd. Also, there is another box in the Connector Building. We're collecting youth and um, ladies gently used and new coats for students at Marnellison. So if you have some coats, please bring those and put those in the box. And today we start our global offering, which will run through Christmas. This is our Christmas offering. And the CBF has divided that offering into three parts. Last year, we collected for poverty. This year, we're collecting for the global church. And next year, it will be for migrating. And for the global church, 100% of what you give this year will go towards field personnel, which is a new word, another word for missionaries. It'll go to their churches for resources and things that they need to buy because they are training people to send them out to do church planning. So I hope that you'll pray. You've got some information today and make a decision on what you'd like to give for global offering. Thanks. Just wanted you to know the need is out there and the need is great. Good morning. Today at three o'clock we meet for our annual uh, Christmas cheer boxes. Uh, I do have some of the dates that's pretty much set in stone. On December the 14th on Thursday, we will separate the food uh, Friday, December the 15th, we will actually pack the food boxes that we're going to deliver to the community. And on the 16th, on Saturday, December the 16th, we will deliver these food boxes. Uh, each one of these events will take uh, place at 9 o'clock in the morning, and that will be at Amalon United Methodist Church. Uh, anyone that would like to participate either one of the three days or all three days, please see me because we sure can use the help. Also, if you submitted a name last year and that individual is still in need of a food box, you need to resubmit that name this year. We do this every year. So I encourage you to get your names in and get them in quickly so we can uh, make sure we've got enough boxes to deliver for the community. Thank you, and if you have any questions, you can please call me. Yes, we're still taking donations for the food box. You can either write the check or give the cash to the church, or you can give it to me if it's cash, and we'll make sure it gets to the right place. Uh, this month, also, we are collecting oatmeal. We found out that the breakfast products are the things that we really need for the children in the community. So. If you have any questions, please see me or call me, and I'll be happy to answer them for you. And again, I thank you for your participation. Is that all? Anyone else? Great. You can see starting now through the rest of the year is one of the reasons why I personally love this church so much is all the ministries and mission projects and things that are going on uh, locally and through, all through the world. And so there's lots for you to get involved with. The last thing I want to say before we begin worship is one of the things I want to offer to you if you're visiting with us, if you are attending and wanting to know more about our church, if you put your name on the bottom piece of the bulletin and tear that off and drop it in the offering plate with a, with a way for me to reach you. Um, I've done this, and it's been a while, but before COVID, we used to do these gatherings where I'd get a couple of you together during Sunday school, uh, and just me and you and a, your spouse or a couple of individuals to learn more about our church, who we are. Uh, it's not a uh, sales pitch. We're not going to try to recruit you that day and you got to sign on the dotted line, but just a getting to know you. And so if you put your name and your best way to reach you and you want, I'll keep, the, I'm going to create a list over the next few weeks and set up some times that we can do that during the Sunday school hour so it's more convenient. I'll have some coffee and maybe in a donut and just kind of talk a little bit about RMBC and anything else you're curious about. So you'll be hearing more about that each week. 
All right, so we're going to begin our worship, our celebration today. Uh, we're going to praise God, and we're going to give thanks for God who is with us this beautiful day. morning. Today's call to worship can be found in your hymnal on 664. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. Please break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy. Their thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the one who sows bountifully will also reap. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful gift. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly every good word. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Would you join me in singing hymn number 667, and the words will be on the screen, as saints of old their first fruits brought. Would you stand, Ms. Ray?
Let us pray. Gracious God, we are thankful in this month of, uh, where we begin to think about how we can serve and reach others through the holiday season. We are grateful, and the gifts we give are expressions of that gratitude. We pray that we'll then go to bless others. We pray these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we continue to worship, we come to our time of prayer, and I want to give you a couple of updates and additions for your prayer concerns. Uh, Leonard Dawson is no longer at the summit. He is home. Uh, we want to pray for the family of George Rawlings. This is a first cousin to Harold Bailey. I'll be doing that funeral service um, in Lynchburg on Friday. Uh, pray for them. Uh, then also, some of you already know this, but we want to pray for the family of Julia Crawford, who passed away. I know many of you know that family and know her, and so we're praying for them. Um, and then um, uh, Jean Wingfield was telling me that she had a niece pass away recently, so we're praying for her family as they grieve and lost a uh, loss this uh, this month. 
And I know there are many, many other concerns listed. Uh, this says Les is at Lynchburg General, but he's now home. Correct? So we can celebrate that. And so that's an update. Um, and so we will uh, continue to pray for all the concerns. They do change quite a bit, so sometimes it's, it's a daily change. So we'll do our best to keep up, help us stay posted on that. I know each and every need is on here. There's lots we're concerned about, some that, um, that may be private. So let's go to God in prayer. Gracious God, on this day, we lift up these names and needs before you. God, we also give thanks for the following. God, on this day, this beautiful fall day, as we gather to worship and praise you and hear beautiful songs, inspirational moments together, uh, see new faces and familiar faces, we just thank you. We worship you and we praise you. And we pray that you'll speak to us this day so that you can speak through us every day. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, we pray. And all God's people say. I did want to add, I, I think uh, Barbara's uh, son's in-law family had a loss. And so I, I know that you had told me this week. So we're going to get that added and pray for them as well. There are a lot of needs out there. So just look for folks you can be a comfort to, a prayer for, and just help in little ways which turn out to be big ways.
beautiful song, inspirational hymn. As we turn to our scriptures, we'll be looking at Matthew 23, verses 1 through 12. The scripture reads, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to be called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Let us pray. Gracious God, take these words and may they speak to us this day as we need to hear them as they are vital for our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And as I forgot to say, this is the word of God. All right. Have you ever thought that someone was one way, but their actions revealed them to be a very different person? Has that ever happened to you? Now, I'm not talking about one slip or mistake. No one is perfect, and it's not fair to judge someone you know or someone you've heard of by a bad moment or a bad slip or a bad day. This, this happens. We, we have them too. Okay, all of us do. We don't want to do that. But when we see a totally different nature exposed in someone that we didn't know was there, it can be disappointing and even devastating. Sometimes it's a sports figure or a celebrity that you just love and idolize, and maybe you meet them or you find out their real self is a little different. Maybe it's a leader or a politician. Sometimes it's a pastor or a beloved teacher. And sometimes it can be family, friends. It's worse when it's a friend or a family member, someone we're very close to. That's, those kinds of betrayals are hard. We want someone to be real, honest, true to who they claim to be. What we want is the word you saw on the sign as you pulled into the parking lot. Our word for the sermon is authentic. We want someone to be authentic. The truth is we live in a world that oftentimes is not very authentic. It can be fake. It can be shallow. And sometimes we are misled or mistaken about what we think to be true. And it really, really hurts. It hurts to be lied to. It's hurt, it's hurt to, uh, to lift something or someone up and to find out they aren't what we thought they were. Because all of us deep down, all of us here today are longing for people and relationships and the things we believe in to be authentic. Not perfect, we get that, but authentic. Real, not fake. Someone to be who they claim to be. And so that's the word I give you today is authentic. And it is a word that we need to find lived out in the flesh. It's a word that is vital. If we as Christians are going to be who we say we are, we got a lot of work to do. The world watches religious institutions and churches. They watch religious people, and they love to point it out when we fall short. They do, and we deserve it often. Churches are accused of being places where hypocrites gather. People don't trust preachers. When I was growing up, ministers and preachers were kind of lifted up and well thought of. It's not that way. Along with other professions, we're not the most trustworthy in people's minds these days. A few bad apples have made the bushel hard to live in. It's hard because people don't think that what we're talking about is for real. And so I tell you as your pastor, I really want to be authentic. I'll never claim to be perfect, but I desperately don't want to be fake. And I know you don't either. So how can we do this? How, is we, how can we as Christian people, as God's people, cultivate a sense of authenticity so that we are not frauds? Well, Jesus gives some basic ideas in the scripture passage I read to you. You could call this rules to live by or maybe rules for real living, and here they are. And they're really important. 
As I think about church and churches and religion and ministry, uh, these are vital to us if we want to bear witness to the living love of God. Rule number one, and these are basic, as, as people of faith, as leaders or whoever we are in faith, don't guilt trip people. Don't guilt trip people. Guilt trips are terrible. Look at the scripture. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on people's shoulders, other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to help them or to move them. Jesus in his ministry was often at odds with people who were religious, religious leaders. Now, I want to be very careful here. Not every religious leader that Jesus met in his day was a fraud, nor are all the ones you're going to meet. If we say that all of the religious leaders in Jesus' day were crooked, that's anti-Semitic. These are Jewish leaders, and to say that they're all frauds is simply not true. Many were wonderful people who did what they did to help others and were good to their people. Uh, many be- were, were offended by Jesus because they had deep, passionate love and got with God, and they just they felt what they were hearing wasn't true, and they didn't understand who this Jesus was. But the truth is, Jesus ran into his share of, in, of people who led in faith who are not authentic, just like you and I can run into. And so Jesus warns about those as he would about those who claim to be speaking for God today. Some today, probably most religious leaders, are are honest and trustworthy people who love God and love others, and some are not. And Jesus reminds them that often there are leaders who have positions of respect and authority, but they are not real. So how do you know if someone is a fake? Not just preachers, but anyone in faith. Well, that expression that he gave, if they preach but don't practice, you don't practice what you preach. They tell you to do one thing while they do another. And this fakeness is mostly shown through the guilt trips I mentioned. Tying up heavy loads on people, but not helping them. Making people feel guilty, but not showing them a better way to get out of the guilt. As a kid raised in church whose parents made me go Sunday morning to Sunday school, Sunday worship, We had church training union or discipleship training at night, which was just another Sunday school. And then we had Sunday night worship. Well, all my friends got to stay home and watch the Disney Channel. There was a Sunday night Disney movie that came out as a kid, and I saw none of them. Because I had to go to church, because my dad was a deacon. They were very involved in church. And on Sunday nights, I often was the only young person sitting on the back row. But I was there. And then afterwards, they'd have a deacon's meeting, and I'd have to sit in the hallway and wait for that to end. And then we had to come on Wednesday for that midweek service. And then we had fall and spring revivals, sometimes lasting two weeks. And we could not miss a night because it wasn't right to miss. And we had cottage prayer meetings leading up to said revivals. Anybody live those days? It didn't hurt me. But I was in church more than I was home. And during some of the revival sermons, sitting in the pews... I got the sense that the purpose and the goal of that sermon was to make me feel so bad that when I left, I just felt horrible. Anybody ever hear a sermon like that? There wasn't a lot of grace and freedom. There was just a lot of guilt. And I've often thought, and I thought as a kid, what good is it to show people how bad they are without showing people how things could be better? Now, These teachers Jesus is working with aren't teaching lies. They are teaching Moses' law. And Jesus was a man who followed the same law and, make no mistake, was a faithful Jew. But through the years, the explanations and teachings from some of the leaders became so detailed and nuanced, and the rules explaining the rules became so complicated and impossible to follow that you just felt guilty all the time. They had so many rules and nitpicking that no one ever thought they were good enough, and you lived a life of defeat. And here becomes the question for us today. If following God makes us feel worse and defeated, what's that about? Why would anyone want to follow a God who just wants you to feel miserable? Now, the flip side of that is that folks can say, well, I get you there, but shouldn't you be talking more about sin and making people straighten up? Through my ministry in my life, I've had a few people come along who 
have accused me of being too easy on people, that I really need to get hard on you folks. I've had that said to me before. I've been accused of supporting sin because I don't get up here and stand in the pulpit and just let you have it. Well, let me be clear. If you were to take my sermons and look at them, I do talk about sin. I am no denier of sin. But I'm not going to ever get up here and blast you so that you feel worthless and unloved. Because here's, here is the truth. I know you sin, and I am going to lay odds that I bet you know you sin. But what I want to do is lift up Jesus and point out the love of God for you and to you. I also noticed early in my ministry that the people who were very concerned about the rules and me giving it to the pews always wanted me to talk about sins. Personally, were struggling with. They just wanted to talk about their neighbor's problems. It's kind of like standing in your yard and you know you need to mow it and weed eat it, but you're just fussing about the bushes in the next yard, right? I always noticed that. Now, I don't want to act like I'm above all that. I can be judgy too. I can be that way. I can be self-righteous, as can everybody in the pews. We all have our comments. We all feel that way. But I do, in the end of the day, hope you and I can agree that all of us are sinners who found Jesus. I know that is true of me, and I invite you to find the same Jesus. Not out of guilt, but grace, and I do think there's going to be some guilt, of course. We should feel guilty when we are wrong, but that guilt should lead us somewhere. Not to misery, but meaning, not because we're a loser, but because we are loved. Because I know this, and I bet you do too. I know that apart from God, my life is a mess, and I make it a mess, and I make it worse. And even with God, I know that I still make messes, and I need God. I believe in Jesus, and I also believe Jesus loves you. Guilt is fine if it motivates us to grace, but we can never leave people with burdens too heavy to bear and no love to help them find relief. So that's the first one. Jesus said it, not me. Second thing he said, which is also pretty hard to tell, is don't be showy. Don't be showy. Rule number two, don't be showy. Look what he says. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. Unquote. The leaders Jesus, were talking to, Jesus was talking to were not authentic. They were showy. They were about showing off and displaying their greatness. Everything they did was for folks to see them. Now, there is nothing wrong with religious clothing. Not at all. Many traditions wear them. I've seen Orthodox priests in South America in full garments in the heat of the day. Some Christians wear clergy collars. Some of my friends do. There is nothing wrong with it. I have worn robes and stoles myself. But what Jesus is talking about here is more than religious clothing. He's talking about people who have the wrong, opinion, the wrong motivation behind the religious look. For example... Phylacteries. I bet that's in your vocabulary today, right? You talk about phyl phylacteries all the time, right? What in the world is that? Well, they were small containers that you would wear on your body and tie to your body, the religious leaders would, that had scripture verses. Scripture. Well, they didn't have verses and chapters, but it had wor words from scripture in them. What in the world could be wrong with that? It would be like wearing a t-shirt that says John 3.16 on it. What is wrong with that? Jesus sees nothing wrong with that. It's just that they were more about saying, look what I'm wearing, even though I'm not reading and I'm certainly not living by what's inside those boxes. And that's what he was talking about. I mean, they wanted the best seats. There's nothing wrong with that. You know the best seats in a Baptist church are the first two pews. We, don't, we charge double, right? That's why you don't sit there, right? Uh, kidding, kidding. They're free. But the best seats in the house to be seen. To be seen. It's all about what's in your heart. What is your motivation? Check yourself. They were more about appearance than performance. Hear that. More about appearance than performance. And as Christians, sometimes we more, worry more about who we are than what we are doing. Many eons ago when I was starting out and talking to churches who were looking for a minister, I don't even remember what position it was that I had applied for, one search committee called me, and I don't even remember the church, but I snickered and certainly didn't want to go any further with them when their first comment to me was before we begin talking to you about this position in our church we want you to know that it is an honor for us to even call you and talk to you they were that proud of their church uh, it wasn't a very humble expression 
uh, that I was getting from them. We need humility. As Christians, we all got to be on guard. It isn't look at me. We can have the biggest Bibles tucked in our arms, belong to the biggest church in town, bumper stickers on all of our cars, wearing the right T-shirts, and shaking our heads and our hand fingers at those who we feel uh, are doing wrong. But what good is that if there's no love in our hearts? And there's a, we could go on about all that. The third rule Jesus gives is tied to that. Just don't think too much of yourself. Here's what he says. You're not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you're all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he's in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. Again. The problem wasn't the titles. The problem was the t they wanted the titles because it gave them esteem. They wanted everybody to see them better. They wanted attention to be on self. But the truth was they were not to be the focus of their faith. God was. And that's the problem with power. Power and position, whether religious or political, it's just so seductive. It's so, it, it just feels that need and that ego, and it's a temptation that can lead to all kinds of problems. Now, I'm not against titles. I'm not against them at all. Um, I do have some that I could officially go by, and people often ask me, do you want to be reverend or doctor or pastor? I just want to be called Derek. Now, on official publications, I know you got to write your name and you got to put it in there officially and there's a time and place for all that. That's right. But at the end of the day, when we all stand before God, whether we are the president or the pope or Derek Hamby or you, we all stand equal at the foot of the cross. And none of those things that divide and make us feel elevated matter one I was in a deacon's meeting when I was in a particular community as a youth minister, and, and that was a scientific community, a professional community. There were more PhDs in that room than any church I've ever served, scientists and engineers and physicists that worked for the laboratories there in Tennessee. And I remember one deacon saying, I just want to be clear, when I'm in this room, I'm going to call everybody for their first name. I really don't care where you work. I really don't care what your title is. I don't care what they call you on Monday. And I thought, well, that's true. Because in here, we're all serving God. We're at the same level. Now, that's where the Baptist tradition of the priesthood of the believer can really help. Because our heritage and our history is we have clergy, but we all have a voice and a vote. That's why we have a business meeting today. We all stand equal before God and responsible before God. This isn't my church. This church was here before I came, and it will be here when I'm gone, as it will be with you. This is our church together. We're in this together. And so the final thought, final thought, humility. It's the key. Jesus says, the greatest among you will be your servant, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. If you go to France, there's a Reformed church that has three panels on the platform there, very large, colorful, beautiful panels, and they're scriptural. And the first is, says for the law, and it has this verse, Matthew 22, 37, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. The second in the middle is the gospel panel, and it has the verse John three sixteen. You know that. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting lives. Interesting, the third panel is a little unique. It's not one you typically see. It's from the Psalms. And it is Psalm 118, verse 14. And it says... The Lord is my strength and song, S-O-N-G, and has become my salvation. The Lord is my strength and song and has become my salvation. Notice that that third panel, while it says that the Lord is strength, but also that the Lord is song. We do not emphasize that enough, and we should. In the way we practice our Christianity, God is our song, we need to sing the joy of being in Christ when we worship as we live our lives throughout the week. And it is an amazing message. When we are humble and live the life God has called us to, then our lives will become, and I'll be honest, more of a song than a sermon. Because we don't preach guilt and pride, but we sing praise and joy. Drawing others to God who drew us together in love. God, Jesus calls us to this joy by serving, and the key will always be humility. Our Lord Jesus washed the feet of his disciples on that final night before he died. He did this to teach the reality and the need of servanthood. Even Peter struggled with that idea. 
but it was to show us that power is found in service. The church does best when we learn this, that it's about God, not us. It's for others, not us. When we give it away, when we love all, that's how we find authenticity. If we do this, we will point others to the one who can bring freedom to us all. There's a story I love to tell about the noted director of the of biblical movies, Cecil B. DeMille. When they were working on that great movie, Ben-Hur, DeMille talked to Charlton Heston, the star of the movie, about a chariot race at the end of the movie. Many of you know this story. He decided Heston should learn to drive the chariot. There was no CGI. They were really going to ride chariots down the street and film it. And instead of using a stunt double, he wanted Heston to drive that chariot, something Heston wasn't used to doing and didn't know how to do. He agreed to take chariot driving lessons. I don't know who teaches that, but apparently they existed, to make the movie as authentic as possible. Learning to drive a chariot with horses four abreast was no small matter. After extensive work and, and days of practice, Charlton Heston went to DeMille and said, quote, I think I can drive the chariot all right, Cecil, but I'm not at all sure I can actually win the races. You know, they're going to film a race. I don't think I can win it. Smiling, the director of that movie said, Heston, you just stay in the race and I'll make sure you win. It's the job of the director. You stay in the race, friends. I'll stay in the race. We'll stay in the race. And God, the director of all things, will make sure we win the race. That's not our job. We live our lives in the light of God to do this life right, authentic and real, not fake and shallow, putting God first, doing the hard work, keeping self in check, because God has this. May we stay with God, always be the real you. And finally, hear this, if nothing else, before we pray. Let the real you be shaped by the very real God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we read these words of Jesus and we just squirm. They're so difficult but needed. They remind us that we get in the way. We get in the way of our own joy. We get in the way of your love for us and others. And so our prayer today is that we just get out of the way. That we humble ourselves. That we check ourselves. That we just realize who we are by realizing who you are. And then things will just be so much better, richer, more beautiful. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit we pray. And all God's people say. Amen. Our hymn of decision is, let your heart be broken as you stand to your feet to sing this song. If you want to make a public decision to seek baptism, to seek faith, uh, to unite with our church, I'll be here at the front to greet you. But let us stand.
is so good to be with you today, and uh, this is one of my favorite times of the year as we just, music and, and the service and the ministry and the mission projects and just everything that is happening all around us. So there's something you need to know about how to be involved in some of the things you've heard today. Feel free to call us. We want to get, get that to you. Be praying if you didn't fill out a card and you're curious, or if you know someone who's curious about knowing more about our church, more about baptism, more about faith, anything, very casual conversations. If you like coffee and donuts, it's all you got to like. And if you don't like coffee or donuts, you can drink water and let me eat my donut in front of you. Uh, so it'll be fine. So no, no, no pressure. We did these many times. Some of you have been through them through the years, and it's just, just conversations. So often I see you in the pews, and we just don't get to talk and know more about what you want to ask and know about this community. So excited about that. Uh, we will close in prayer, and then we'll have a business meeting in just a couple of minutes. We don't have to wait all the way to 1215. Just come on back in. The youth and those involved with that want to go down to the fellowship hall. Uh, they're going to go down there and get ready for, uh, we're going to work them hard, right? We're going to make them chop trees down. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just just going to kid. But we do want to reach out. I love what Jim said. If you can think of some folks that need some help this year with our cheer boxes or something, be help letting us know. We want this Christmas from the Jericho toy box barrel to the food boxes to all the things we're doing, the things Ann mentioned. We want to just look outside of ourselves to bless somebody this closing part of the year. Let's close in prayer. Gracious God, be with us as we leave this place to the places you take us. There will be so many opportunities to do your work. May we be open, responsive, creative, innovative, and say yes. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Thank you.